Good morning, and welcome to worship service at Webb Baptist Church. So good to see you today and to have you here for this service. Uh, Jeremy and I spoke of the fact that um, it's kind of mixed emotions for us. I've, I, I've lost count a little bit over how many interims I've had. I think this is 27 or 28 along that line. But this one's different from all the others. And uh, because I knew many of you and your families before I came, and she did too. And uh, then to get reacquainted has been a real special thing. And uh, we thank you all for the opportunity to have served here and just to renew acquaintances and meet new people and new friends. It's been a wonderful opportunity. If you would please uh, read the notes in the bulletin and the uh, opportunities of ministry there. And again, week by week, uh, people furnish us beautiful flowers. And these flowers today on the communion table are given by Pam and Luke as they celebrate their 40th wedding anniversary. So we're grateful for them for these beautiful flowers. But it's good to see you today. You enter into our worship by singing uh, with us. Uh, Brother Kevin and the choir will lead us, but you sing with us, okay? Good to see you today. Well, I have a couple things I'd like to say. Um, first of all, Amanda and I want to extend a very, very enormous thank you to anyone who participated in or helped with or even showed up to our wedding. Uh, it was a very special day for us. Um, obviously, we've been hunting mooning all week, so we're exhausted. Uh, last night was really our first night to relax in the house and, and just kind of be by ourselves and enjoy enjoy that. And um, I think this morning about 3 o'clock, someone broke into the house looking for money, and I think Amanda got up to help them look. <laughs> not sure whatever became of that. But <laughs> Uh, and also, uh, after the service today, we will be having a, a covered dish in the fellowship hall to honor uh, Brother Jerry and Jerry May. We are eternally grateful for them, for their service to our church and, and their mentorship and their leadership, uh, especially during a, a tough time for us. So let's stand and sing. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made, we will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made, we will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day. a beautiful Sunday. We're all happy to be here. Let's do number 746. There's within my heart a melody. Jesus whispers sweet and low. Jesus, Jesus, sweetest name 
the starry sky. I shall wing my flight to worlds unknown. I shall reign with him on high. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me safe. smiling face. There is sunshine in my soul. There is sunshine in my soul today. More glorious and bright than glows in any earthly sky. For Jesus is my light. Oh, there's sun shows his smiling face. There is sunshine in my soul. There is music in my soul today. For when the Lord is near, the dove of peace sings in my heart. The flowers of grace appear. Oh, there's sun Sunshine, blessed sunshine, when the peaceful, happy moments roll, when Jesus shows his smiling face, there is sunshine in my soul, there is gladness in my soul today. Please be seated. If you would, please, let's pray. Praise the Lord. Praise him, all ye servants of the Lord. Praise him, all who are in the house of the Lord. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for the Lord is good. Give thanks to the Lord for his mercy and dear is forever. We're grateful, O oh God, that your compassion fails not and your mercy is new every morning. Great is your faithfulness and wonderful is the joy we have in fully trusting in you. We come to your presence today in brokenness, Lord, because we know we have sinned. There are times we've been unfaithful and unwilling to change. We've chosen too many times to close our ears to your small voice. There have been times we have betrayed you. There have been times we have hurt the ones we love and caused trouble for ourselves. We have lived the Christian life too casually and broken faith for what we believe by serving the world rather than walking in your way. For all our sins and rebellion, mistakes and shortcomings, we ask, O oh Lord, for your forgiveness. We claim your word that if we confess our sins to you, that you will be faithful and forgive us of all of our sins. Our Father, we come today as a church to pray for one another. We pray for those who are sick and need healing. We pray for those who are hurting and need freedom from pain. Give, O oh Lord, special grace to those who grieve and mourn over the death of loved ones. 
increase their faith and their hope in you is our prayer. We ask you to provide answers for those who are living in doubt. We ask, O oh Lord, that you'd give relief to those who suffer mentally and emotionally. We love our brothers and sisters who are hurting. We ask that you would show us how to help them to ease their suffering and to reduce their worry and anxiety. Lord, please comfort and guide those who especially need our help today. We pray for Ronald Sims and Sally and the family. We pray for Frank McDonald. Lord, we pray for Bridget Tate and we pray for LaVon. We pray for Lauren and Lance and Betty Bowie. And Lord, we pray for Charlotte Nile. Be their constant stay. Be with all of them, Lord, as they trust in you and we trust in you with them. Lord, we thank and thank you today for sending us a pastor to lead us as a church. Please guide and protect and bring safely to us Brother Danny and Jan. Bless their ministry, O Lord God, among us as they come to serve you and work beside us. And this we pray in the strong and loving name of Jesus Christ our Lord and for his dear sake. Amen. We will stand. We'll sing hymn number 762.
And all the people said, Amen. Amen. That's good. Thank you. Uh, I mentioned to Belinda, Kevin, and Amanda, I, you're not in a place to hear the beautiful music before the ceremony started for your wedding. But it was beautiful music. I, I assumed y'all picked it. I don't know who picked it out, but it was beautiful. And uh, just so uh, it was helpful for all of us who were sitting here as just part of the worship service. That was, that was really neat. So good to see you today. Uh, fellas, if you have those sermon notes, you'll pass those out for me. I appreciate that. Now, every preacher doesn't do it the same way. Uh, Brother Danny may not do sermon notes. He may know what he's doing. Uh, I don't know what I'm doing, so I have to read everything I do. Uh, but you uh, give him uh, space like you've given to me. As a matter of fact, I thought of this. If you if you would treat him and Jan like you treated me and Jeremy, that'd be great. You you treat them the way you've treated us. Uh, we've enjoyed it, and y'all been good to us. And you loved us and helped us, and worked with us, and permitted us to work with you. Uh, and that's been a joy. So you you do the same with them as you've uh, been with us. Someone was reminding me this morning that uh, uh, today is a day, a little bit, you know, of, of mixed feelings. They said, well, you all ought to move to Webb. And I have looked at a couple of lots for years on the corner of uh, Wallace, Bowie, and Dexter up there. My grandfather owned that property for years and had a house there. And then right across the street, there's another vacant lot, grown up, but a vacant lot. And I said, well, you know, you never know what might happen one day. Then Jeremy reminded us, don't forget, we've got two lots across the street. I said, well, <laughs> we, we, we may get those first, so we'll, we'll, we'll see. Thank you guys for passing that out. I want us to do something. By the way, um, any times I got ready to preach here, I'd, I would say and I've been here nine months, a part of ten months. But I've been here a full nine months. And uh, I would say in that month, nine months' time, there's been about five occasions where I said, oh, I don't know if I would preach that or not. And he immediately would come, this would come to me, you can go ahead and preach it because you can trust them. That's, I'm telling you. And I mean that as a compliment. That any time I felt that I was going to preach something, it might be a little edgy. Uh, 
it came to me, oh, go ahead and preach it. You can trust them. You can trust them. And uh, that very thing happened two or three Wednesday nights ago. I don't think I've missed but a couple of Wednesday nights, or maybe three in the nine months I've been here. Man, missed two Sundays, one preaching, one COVID. And uh, uh, on that Wednesday night a few weeks ago, our family from Kentucky was going to be coming through and there was about an 18 hour span there they were going to be in town and some other family was going to be available and so on Tuesday I called brother Aaron and said brother Aaron I, I need you to cover for me because I've got 14 family members that can get together only Wednesday night and you know what I said well I wonder how the church would feel about that and guess what came to me well they'll trust me I trust them and they'll trust me. And I didn't uh, feel guilty about it nor embarrassed about it. I spent that Wednesday night with my family. And uh, they were passing through and it was just good to be able to be with them. I think, I think you, if you love one another and trust one another, a church and a preacher, you, it helps. You know what I'm talking about? Because sometimes preachers do strange things, but you may not understand why they did them. But if you trust them, I'll say this. How long should you trust a preacher? Trust him until you can't trust him. You got, you got my point? I mean, trust him until you... I'd say the same thing is true of a church. If a preacher asked me about a church, I'd say, well, trust him until you can't trust him. I'd say that's the kind of relationship. Didn't mean to preach that sermon, but, uh, but it did. I trust you. I did. Luke chapter 9 verses 28 to 36. I want to read all three of these because there's, there's information in each one of them that the other two passages do not have. And I would remind you that neither of these three uh, writers, Luke, Matthew, or Mark, neither of them were eyewitnesses of this account. So they got this information from someone else. Who did they get it from? I suspect some of it came from Jesus. I suspect some of it came from Simon Peter. And some of it might have come from John. But I want us to read all three of these passages and, and you'll see that each one gives us some information that others didn't give. Luke 9, 28 to 36, the transfiguration. About a week after he had said these things, uh, some say seven days, six days, some say eight days. Luke says about a week after he had said these things, uh, what was said in the previous episode what you would read is Peter uh, Jesus asked Peter who do men say that I am and they said well some say you're Isaiah some say that you're uh, Jeremiah and some say you're John the Baptist returned from the dead and Jesus looked at Simon Peter and said who do you say that I am and Simon Peter said thou art Christ the son of the living God and Jesus said blessed art thou Simon Barjona uh, the Lord God himself uh, gave that information to you and upon your faith people like you I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not be able to prevail against it now after that happened about a week after that happened this event happened the transfigurations Jesus took Peter, John and James with him and went up into a hill to pray I meant to ask Cindy before the, she left with the children uh, she was the most recent person in the Holy Land that I know of in the church, uh, where they took them for the Mount of Transfiguration. I suspect they took them to Mount Tabor. The times Jeremy and I have gone to the Holy Land, we've always gone to Mount Tabor. Even when we've led the groups ourselves, they say, oh, let's go to Mount Tabor. There's a gift shop there, a big gift shop. There's also a fort up on top of the mountain. But that mountain is only 1,700 feet tall. Right north of there is Mount Hermon, or Mount Hermon, as they call it. It's 9,000 feet tall. So most Bible scholars say that it's not Mount Tabor where you'd go on the Holy Land visit today that they say the transfiguration happened, but it was on Mount Hermon. And by the way, as you get up on Mount Hermon, uh, you can look and you can see Lebanon and you can see Syria and you can see United Nations troops separating them from Israel. All that 
is going on today. And as pointed out by some, on a clear, clear day, you can see the Mount, Mount Hermon from the Dead Sea 100 miles away. It's that big, that tall, and it's covered in snow, always covered in snow. So where did he go on the hill to pray? I think to Mount Hermon. He took Peter, John, and James and said, let's go pray. While he was praying, his face changed its appearance and his clothes became dazzling white. Uh, this was the change. The word here is metamorphosis. Same thing, caterpillar, butterfly, a change, a radical change, a transfiguration. Suddenly, two men were there talking with him. They were Moses and Elijah. Moses lived 1,500 years uh, B.C. Elijah lived 800 years B.C. But now they've been in heaven for that many years, 1,500 and 800 years. But here they are with Jesus in the transfiguration, Moses and Elijah. They appeared in heavenly glory and talked with Jesus about he would soon fulfill God's purpose by dying in Jerusalem. Now, the other two don't say what they talked about. Only Luke tells us that. What did they talk about? By the way, you know what the Greek word there is? The Greek word is exodus. It's not dying. The Greek word there is exodus. Don't know what your text has. But what did, they, what did Moses and Elijah talk to Jesus about? His exodus. In six months, he's going to the cross. His exodus. He's leaving. Guess what? Both of them have had that exodus. Moses has been in heaven uh, 1,500 years. Elijah has been there 800 years. Both of them have had that exodus, and they told Jesus, let us tell you about it. And Peter, James, and John got to overhear that. Wouldn't that have been an interesting conversation to hear? Wouldn't that have been interesting to know? And look how they died. Elijah didn't die. He just took off in a whirlwind. We don't know where Moses was buried. According to Deuteronomy, God buried Moses. God buried Moses. Peter, we think, died a violent death. Uh, James, Peter, James, and John. James was not the first martyr, but he was the first leader in the Christian church that was martyred. Stephen was the first martyr. So all of these know about death. Every one of these, they know about death. And they discussed death and dying with Jesus before he went to the cross. Peter and his companions, companions were sound asleep, but they awoke and saw Jesus' glory and the two men who were standing with him. As the men were leaving, Peter said to him, Master, it's a good thing that we're here. We will make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He really did not know what he was saying. While he was still speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them with its shadow, and the disciples were afraid as the cloud came over them, and a voice said from the cloud, This is my son, whom I have chosen. Listen to him. Now this voice was the voice of the Lord, I believe, the Lord God, and he was talking to Peter, James, and John, but also to Elijah and Moses. He said, this is my son whom I've chosen. Listen to him. He was talking to those others standing there. Now, at Jesus' baptism, he talked to Jesus. He said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. At his baptism, he talked to Jesus. Here, he talked to those others who were standing there. When the voice stopped, there was Jesus all alone. Well, that's a pretty good picture right there. They were standing with Moses and Elijah, and the voice of God spoke. The cloud came, and then there was just Jesus there, Jesus there alone. And the disciples kept quiet about all this and told no one at that time a single thing that had happened. Now look in Matthew 17, 1 through 13. Matthew 17, 1 through 13. Six days later, Luke said about a week, Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and the brothers James and John, led them up a high mountain by themselves, and as they looked on, a change came over him, over Jesus, 
His face became as bright as the sun. Luke didn't tell us that. His face became as bright as the sun, a bright light. And his clothes were white as light. That was that change, that transfiguration. His face was bright as the sun. The sun doesn't reflect anything. The sun is a source. This was not the outward part of Jesus. This was his inward part, bright as the sun. And his clothes were white as light. Then the three disciples saw Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. So Peter spoke up and said to Jesus, Lord, it's a good thing that we're here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, tabernacles. Here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was talking, a shining cloud came over them, and a voice said from the cloud, This is my own dear son, with whom I well please. Listen to him. When the disciples heard the voice, they were so terrified that they threw themselves face down on the ground. And Matthew is the only one who pointed this out. Jesus came to them. He reached out and touched them and said, get up. Don't be afraid. So they looked up and saw no one else except Jesus. As they came down from the mountain, Jesus ordered them, don't tell anyone about this vision. You've seen until the Son of Man has been raised from death. Then the disciples asked Jesus, Why do the teachers of the law say that Elijah has to come first? Elijah does not indeed come first and answer Jesus. He will get everything ready. Now Mark 9, 2 to 13. Mark 9, 2 to 13. Six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him, and they went up to a high mountain by themselves. As they looked on, a change came over him, this transfiguration, this metamorphosis, and his clothes became very shining and white. Nobody in the world could clean them as white as they were. Then the three disciples saw Elijah and Moses who were talking with Jesus. Peter spoke up and said to Jesus, Teacher, it's a good thing that we are here. We'll make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He and the other were so frightened, they didn't know what to say. A cloud appeared and covered them with its shadow, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my own dear son. Listen to him. They took a quick look around, but they did not see anybody, only Jesus. As they came down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, don't tell anyone what you've seen until the Son of Man has been raised from death. They obeyed his order, but among themselves they started discussing the matter. What does this rising from death mean? And they asked Jesus, why do the teachers of the law say that Elijah had to come first? His answer was, Elijah does indeed come first to get everything ready. Yeah, why do the scriptures say that the Son of Man will suffer much and be rejected? I tell you, however, that Elijah has already come and that people did to him all they wanted to just as the scriptures said about him. Exciting worship. In my opinion, in my opinion, that's the most exciting worship service in the New Testament. That's it. Now let me ask you something. Have you ever been in an exciting worship service? I've been in a lot of worship services. Uh, some were exciting and some were not. And, and those that were not was mostly my fault. But I've been, in some, I, I've been in some worship services. Somebody said in one service one time that uh, two people died in the service and they took out three before they got the two that died. They didn't realize how many had already passed on. A little boy saw something in the vestibule of a church one time. He had the people who had given their lives in World War I, World War II, and the Korean War, and Vietnam. And he asked his daddy, he said, Daddy, what, why are their names up there? And his daddy said, they died in service. He said, was it morning service or evening service? Which, which why? I mean, I've been in those kind. I know, I know about those kind of services, okay? I've led some of them. But let me tell you what, I've been in some exciting services too. I'm just going to mention briefly a few. Uh, the service that comes to my mind, first of all, is when I was called to preach. 
I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because I've done that. I went in detail about this a couple of weeks ago. I was at Shaco Springs, and I heard a voice that said, I want you to preach. Didn't believe it was me, but I heard it again even stronger and realized it was me, and I went down front, and I didn't even shake the preacher's hand. <clears throat> I went and I just sat down on the platform. I just went and sat down on the platform. I was crying, 16 years old, 15 years old, and I was crying, and Mrs. Marshall from First Baptist Church, Dothan, came and sat down beside me, and she said, Jerry, can I help you? And I said, no, I'm going to have to work this out on my own. That's what I told her, and she, she let me. <clears throat> Many people came forward, but to me, that was a very important worship service. I well remember that service. I'm going to tell you about another service. About a year later, I was about 16, a man by the name of Theo Sapp, who had been pastor of First Baptist Church Cowards, invited me to come to Oneonta, Alabama, to preach in a youth rally. Uh, Bird Bowie and Jim Ray Smith, dear friends of mine, were students at Howard College. And so I got in touch with them. I said, can you guys, I didn't, I didn't have a car, couldn't drive a car. I didn't learn to drive until I bought a car. I bought a car and had to learn to drive it. My roommate taught me how to drive it. Uh, but I, I didn't have a car, and, and, and so I called Bird and Jimmy Ray. I said, guys, I'll, I'll take a bus to Birmingham if y'all take me to Oney And they said, oh, we'd be glad to do it and go with you. So Bird and Jimmy Ray went with me to Oney And I preached that night. There was about 300 teenagers there. After I got through preaching, 16-year-old boy, maybe preached 25 times. When I got through preaching, uh, kids came forward weeping and the preachers started speaking to them and other pastors got up and came because so many were coming and I never seen anything like it and so there was a side door and I just went out the side door I said Lord I don't know what this is I've never seen anything like this but I also said this but I know it ain't me I know it's not me. But if you will, you help me. I'm 16 years old. You help me to be the preacher I need to be in my life. And I'll, I'll be faithful to you. So I remember that service. And I'll just mention another one. Uh, we had Angel Martinez in a revival meeting one time in a county seat town. And uh, the county seat town was 4,100 people. That was the population. We had... 100 people that made decisions that week, registered decisions, 100 people. We baptized 50 in the river. And I told the church, this week, out of every 100 people you see, a lot of them made decision in this revival meeting. A lot of them made decisions in this revival meeting. The mayor made decisions. City police chief made decisions. A couple of councilmen made decisions. It was just a uh, police chief, yeah, made decisions. I mean, I, I just never will forget that week. It was just a fantastic week. But let me tell you what. The Transfiguration, I believe, is the greatest worship service there's ever been. God looked at Jesus and said, this is my son. I want you to listen to him. I want you to listen to him. And notice there on your sheet, why was that true? The event was bathed in prayer. Anytime you come to a worship service, you need to pray about it. You need to pray about it. I was sitting in uh, the church one day where I was pastor. Church was empty, and I was sitting on about the third or fourth row. Church was empty. It was during the week. And uh, my son came through and said, Daddy, what are you doing? I, mean, I was in church. Nobody else. What are you doing? I said, I'm praying. I've known pastor friends who on Saturday would go down to the church and kneel at the end of every row, because you pretty know where people sit, generally. They would kneel and pray a minute, 
at the end of every row, remembering those who sat on that row and knowing some by name that sat on that row. I never did that, but I thought it was pretty good. I did do this. Uh, where I was pastor, I've driven, I was pastor of four different churches, four different states. Some people had to leave town when they passed. I had to leave the state after I got through the church. I was pastor in Alabama and then Mississippi and Louisiana and Florida. Uh, I did do this. I would drive around town where my people lived and pray for them as I drove by their house. But you need to pray about a worship service. Pray about a worship service. Second observation. Exciting worship is when God is there. God in his glory and his mighty, weighty presence. When God is present, it's exciting. When God's present, things happen that we can't cause. I skipped uh, number two. Uh, uh, it was exciting because they loved one another. How do I know they loved one another? I tell you the big hint for me was if the presence of God in that cloud just knocked them to the ground and Jesus did what? Matthew said he reached over and touched them and said, get up. I mean, he loved them. They loved him or he wasn't, they wouldn't go to the mountain with him. A worship service is exciting and needful and it's so important that we love one another in a worship service. That we love one another in a worship service. The fourth thing now. Exciting worship service is there is a touch of eternity in the meeting. Moses and Elijah and Jesus was there. Moses represented the law, Elijah the prophets, Jesus grace. And when the law and the prophets and grace come together, eternity is in that meeting. And every Sunday when we come together, the grace of God is with us. And that's exciting. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, that any man should boast, is the gift of God. And number five, there was a presence of all in the meeting. There. When that, this event of the transfiguration, the disciples were so much in awe, they didn't know what to say. They didn't know what to do. They hit the ground. I had a good friend as a truck driver, <clears throat> deacon in the church where I was pastor. He did long distance hauling. A wonderful Christian man, deacon, husband, father, grandfather. He told me that he was driving across the plains one time in the west by himself late at night big huge truck he had he said the Lord was in the cab with me I was singing having a good time and he said I'll always remember him telling me this he said man I had to stop the truck and get out and just walk around he said the truck was just full of God he said I just couldn't take it and I just had to get out and walk around Lord I don't know what this is but and there it was out in Montana or North Dakota or Idaho or somewhere, walking around, and somebody thought, well, that, what's that fool doing? And he was, the presence of God just overtook him. And I'll tell you, that's wonderful when that happens, wherever you are. And number six, Jesus was the primary person in the worship event. Up until this time in the New Testament, his light is very dim. Uh, it's like a wick on a lamp. It's turned down very low. Up until this point in the New Testament, it, uh, Jesus is he's in the crowd and, and they see him, but he, he, a lot of things not going on. But I'm going to tell you what. His wick and his brightness shone from this point forward like never before. He went to the cross in about six months, and the light just got brighter and brighter and brighter and dazzling white because of the Lord God with him and him being obedient to the Lord God. Jesus was a primary person in worship. And by the way, he still is. And then number seven, plans were made for the future in the worship service. Moses and Elijah talked to Jesus about departing, about his exodus, Lord. They said, uh, 
Jesus, you're going to be departing soon. And they have, apparently the Heavenly Father told them that. And here, here's what's going to happen. We want you to know uh, what's going to happen when you uh, go back to heaven. We want you to know what's going to happen when you go back to the Father. We've done that. We want you to know about it. And they talked to him about his exodus, about his departure, about the future. Uh, we sang today hymns about the future, didn't we? About the future. Uh, and how good it is to be in the Lord, to worship in the Lord, to fellowship in the Lord about the future. When I was pastor in Mississippi, uh, we had a revival meeting, and I invited the minister of music, First Baptist Church in Moss Point, J.T. J. Handiford, to come and lead the singing for our revival meeting and did a fantastic job. We had a good meeting. And... Uh, one night, JT said, I want to share with the congregation the best revival service I was ever in. And he said, in that service, one person was saved. But that's the best revival service I was ever in. He said, and by the way, that person was me. Woo. When Jesus is there, it makes a difference, buddy. And getting saved and getting faithful and getting right. Let's bow our heads, please, in prayer. Lord, thank you for exciting worship. When you're there and you're guiding us, you're instructing us, and you're leading us. Help us, our Father, when we have worship in our church, that we look to you. It's exciting when the Holy Spirit of the Lord Jesus enters our church, enters our heart, enters our mind. It makes us want to think about great things that have happened but it also wants us, makes us think about the future and our heart and our life belonging to you forever and ever and one day we'll go and be in your presence with our heads bowed and our eyes still closed have you come here today to make a public decision for Christ Jesus maybe that's your plan you've come here today Trust Christ as your Savior for the first time. Follow him in baptism, church membership. You've come here today to claim this is your church home. You're looking for a church home? This is it. You've come here today planning to make that decision, getting a new pastor, new, new plans, new future. Come and be a part of this church as the Holy Spirit leads you. Maybe you've come here today and saying, I need to make a public recommitment of my life. And, and uh, I know it. The Holy Spirit is leading me to do it. And I choose to do it. In a moment, we're going to sing an invitation hymn. And as we sing that hymn, I invite you to be faithful to what the Holy Spirit would have you to do. Lord Jesus, thank you for your presence in our life and in our worship services. As we sing this hymn, Lord, may we be obedient in our mind and in our heart what you'd have us to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand, please.